Ever wondered what the deal is with vintage instruments? In your guitar geek brain, have you ever weighed the options of vintage guitar versus new guitar? Well, I too wrestled with this notion. In fact, it took me a long time to jump into the vintage arena. And in today's show, in today's hangout, I'm gonna tell you why it took me so long and what guitar made me crack. You don't like it? No, I don't like it. Before I get started on the story of the vintage guitar that totally changed my tune about buying and owning vintage instruments, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Acoustic Tuesday is gearing up for a brand new season coming in October. Now you might be thinking, October, that feels like decades away. What am I going to do until then? Well, don't worry. I'm still going to be reporting from home. Tony, Tony, why home? Well, uh, Whitney and I, my wife Whitney and I, are expecting a new baby boy right around September 18th, in just a, a few short weeks here. And I'm taking this time to be at home, help Whitney out with things around the house, and prepare for the arrival of our new baby boy, Emerson Towns. Again, right around September 18th. I'm not fully sure if that's going to be the exact day, but that's when the doc told us. But you know how babies are and schedules. I don't think they always go according to plan. But nonetheless, I'm super excited for the new uh, season of Acoustic Tuesday. I'm super excited for the arrival of our new baby boy. And uh, since I'm at home, I figured I'd still, well, record a show and it'd be more of a hangout format. So uh, welcome to the hangout, Acoustic Tuesdays at home, if you will. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the story of the vintage guitar that totally changed my perspective on owning and purchasing vintage instruments. Now, I should first say that I wasn't always comfortable with purchasing or owning or even playing vintage instruments. I know that sounds a little weird, but let me, let me explain why. Uh, first and foremost, you know, when you're playing a guitar that is one of a few in a lot of cases, you can't necessarily replace it. So there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Also, you know, in terms of buying a vintage guitar, what do you do when something goes wrong? You know, you don't have the warranty. Who do you take it to? How do you know that the person you take it to is going to repair it in an expert fashion that, that makes it kind of live in its original glory, if you will. And then lastly, you know, if I purchased a vintage guitar, would I be too scared to take it out and actually play it? Would it just sit in my house and not ever see the light of day? And that just didn't sit right with me. So I really kind of kept vintage instruments at bay. I had a lot of opportunities. I worked at both the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago in, the, in their shop, as well as obviously Music Villa here in Bozeman, Montana. I had a lot of opportunities to play a lot of great instruments, uh, see a lot of vintage instruments, but I always, again, kept them at bay for the reasons that I mentioned. And then this little beauty came along. What is this little beauty? This is a 1935 Martin Singolo 17. And I have a little bit of a story with this guitar that I wanna share with you briefly. Um, so I was kind of on the hunt for a small body mahogany guitar and it's all Tony Furtado's fault. He was here in Bozeman uh, on a weekend of, of gigs and workshops and things. And in between uh, a gig and a workshop, he said, uh, we kind of struck up a friendship and he said, hey, why don't you uh, take my guitar for the night? And I just, first of all, was really flattered and, and kind of awestruck that he was like, here, yeah, take my guitar. <laughs> but it gave me a chance. I'm very thankful for that moment. It gave me a chance to really uh, look at his guitar, a vintage. He has, a, like I believe it's a 1934, either single 017 or single 015. I can't remember which. Um, but it, it allowed me to experience a vintage guitar and really get inspired by it. So after that moment, I was on the hunt. Uh, I thought maybe not fully a vintage guitar, but definitely a small body all mahogany instrument. I could stomach that. I, I thought it would be cool. And I also had that guitar geek thought where, you know, you think if you purchase a guitar just like somebody you really enjoy their playing, automatically you'll absorb those skills. Um, it's okay. We all think that way. Um, <laughs> but ultimately it does serve as inspiration, so it's kind of cool. Nonetheless, I was on the hunt, and I didn't think a vintage guitar of that caliber would cross my would cross my radar at all until literally the next weekend. It's funny when you put things out into the world, and then all of a sudden, 
it gets matched. It's like kind of like, well, put your money where your mouth is. So my buddy Ross was working at Music Villa at the time and he texted me a picture of this guitar. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I just had this experience the prior weekend and I thought to myself, uh, here it is, this is the time is now. But there was a problem. The guitar was in total shambles. Uh, there were cracks on the sides, literally holes in the sides. Um, the top was okay. There were some loose braces. It needed a new bridge. It needed a new nut. It needed a refret. It needed a neck reset. It needed new tuners. Um, it needed a ton of work. So immediately I was like, oh, there, there's the catch. This cool guitar comes in, but it needs so much work. I'm just not, I'm not interested. Well, Music Villa does what Music Villa does with all uh, uh, instruments that come in on trade. If they need repair, they get them fixed, so of course they can then sell them. Well, uh, about a month and a half, two months later, somewhere around there, uh, this guitar came back and it was like, it was like it had one of those extreme makeovers. Um, the top was kept original in terms of finish, uh, but it had a new bridge, it got a neck reset, it got a refret, got new tuners. Uh, the back and sides were patched, the, uh, the, the holes were patched, the cracks were cleated, and it was refinished. So this guitar played like a dream and it sounded amazing. And I actually ended up buying the guitar after it came back from repair. And it's this guitar, this very instrument, that all of a sudden made me more comfortable with vintage guitars, more comfortable with the notion of owning them, more comfortable with the notion of entertaining buying them. Because I saw a guitar that was in complete shambles, as I mentioned before, completely be transformed into a very playable instrument that retained all of its original character, that retained all of its original amazing tone, but was made to, to play. It could actually be played. I mean, when this instrument came in, it was not playable. So this guitar showed me kind of the way and ultimately opened up the gates for me to entertain buying vintage guitars, entertain playing vintage guitars, and even entertain playing them out. So what I wanted to do is use this story as a little bit of a catalyst for a discussion between you and I about vintage guitars versus new guitars. Because now I'm very comfortable with vintage instruments. I'm comfortable with, with the notion of, of purchasing them or playing them or owning them. I'm comfortable with taking them out on gigs. I'm comfortable with kind of being the, the steward of their story, if you will. And I wanted to give a bit of a list of kind of, well, I guess the benefits of owning a vintage guitar, or rather maybe things to keep in mind when shopping for a vintage guitar. Because if you're at all like me, you might think, oh, vintage guitar is not for me. Too many problems, too many issues. I don't even know what to do if something were to happen. So let me go ahead and share with you uh, a couple of things that I want you to consider when, well, a vintage guitar crosses your path and your guitar geek heart says, I really want that instrument. I forgot to mention a crucial piece of the story. Because I was reviewing guitars at the time, the original owner caught wind that I ended up purchasing the guitar that he traded. And he called in and he said, hey, um, I actually have some original parts from that guitar. Would you be interested in me sending them to you? And I thought, well, yeah, that'd be so awesome to complete the guitar story. So he sent me uh, the original tuners. These are This is only two. I, I got the full set of six. And he also sent me the original ebony nut which is uh, pretty neat to have, just to kind of complete the story. And then he, he sent me uh, four of the six original ebony bridge pins, which I thought was really cool. So uh, many, many thanks to the original owner for taking the time to, to, to send those in kind of the ultimate guitar geek gesture. So the story of the guitar could continue to be whole with its kind of uh, original pieces. So very, very cool stuff. Now back onto the whole vintage versus new debate. Why would you buy one versus the other? As I said, I've changed my tune on vintage guitars quite a bit and I wanna share some of those reasons, but I also wanna, well, share some reasons why somebody would pick new over vintage as well. Vintage versus new. So this is kind of a heated debate and I wanted to, well, enter that debate. And initially I thought, well, I'll present this in a pros and cons fashion, but I thought, you know, you already kind of got a good dose of the cons because I was sharing with you my initial reservations about buying a vintage guitar. So let's just dive into the pros of each scenario. And after this, I have a very important question for you. So the pros, let's start with, well, let's start with a new guitar. 
So the pros of purchasing a new guitar. Number one, you are the first owner. You're kind of the the uh, the caretaker of that instrument, if you will, from that instrument's infancy until its its older age, which is way cool. Uh, way cool for a couple of reasons, some emotional and some actually uh, quite more uh, logical and practical. Uh, I think one of the practical reasons is, well, you're the original owner, so you generally have a warranty. So if anything were to go wrong, you can take a new guitar, uh, kick it back to the factory, or of course, give it to your local repairman or woman who is an authorized repair center. And then of course, you get your guitar fixed because it's under warranty. That's a huge huge benefit of buying new. Another great benefit of buying new, and I alluded to this earlier, was the fact that you are that guitar's original owner. You're starting that guitar's story, which is so cool. A lot of times people can purchase guitars to signify a significant event. I remember folks coming into the guitar shop all the time, uh, wedding presents, graduation presents, birthday presents, you know, uh, a lot of times a, a father would come in with their son or a whole family would come in and uh, the younger guitar loving geek uh, would be getting their first, you know, real guitar and it was a big moment and a lot of times purchasing a new guitar, it's nice to have that kind of fresh start knowing that you are the original owner and that you're starting this guitar story and that this guitar is going to keep you company all through it and, and your life. So those are some of the pros of purchasing a new guitar. Not to mention, um, a lot of times you can get the guitar made just for you. If you want a pickup, you can get a pickup installed right away with no, th no thought of, oh, is this gonna ruin the value? Is this gonna change its originality? So buying a new guitar in some ways is a little bit more flexible because you can truly tailor it to your needs as a guitar geek. Now, if we flip the coin and visit the vintage side of things, there are quite a few pros in the vintage column as well. In fact, the vintage column, you get a guitar that a lot of times is a rarity. That Martin that I have, I think is one of that year, I wanna say, I think I have this figure in my head for whatever reason. Uh, that year, I think Martin made, 1935, they made, I think, 934 single 017 models, which is pretty cool to say that, wow, I own one of those 934. So there's this kind of sense of entering the guitar story with a vintage instrument. Uh, thinking that, wow, this, there's only a finite number of these instruments that have been made. There will be no more. There may become less, you know, God forbid, but there will be no more made. And that's kind of a, a cool a feather in your guitar geek cap, if you will. Also, you have uh, the tone. I mean, the tone of vintage instruments, they are well seasoned and oftentimes just are mind blowing. Uh, so that's a huge benefit as well. Also, you have a chance to, well, build up a, a relationship with a luthier. Because you don't have the warranty piece, you have a chance to find, to locate a luthier that can make sure your guitar gets treated as best as possible and gets repaired to the utmost level of originality that, that it can be. And uh, a lot of times folks would say, well, that's kind of a con. You have to have a repair person, but I, I disagree. I think this is actually a chance for you to uh, make a connection with a luthier who you trust who can fix your new guitars as well as your vintage guitars. Uh, there's so many great repair people out there uh, and and they um, they can really give you comfort and confidence as a guitar geek to know that you know everything can be fixed. I know we don't want to be put in situations where things can be fixed but everything truly can be fixed. Uh, so that's another benefit of, of purchasing a vintage guitar. And I think I, I alluded to this earlier, but the fact that you're taking a piece of history, a guitar that already has some miles behind it, a guitar that really already has its story started, and then you become the steward of that story, that's pretty darn cool. Oftentimes I'll wonder, man, what the hell did that 1935 single 017, what, what the hell did it see? What has it gone through? Who played it? I mean, you never know. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it right now. You never know. I mean, that that guitar that I own could have very well been played by some of the some of my acoustic guitar idols. I won't know that, but just that notion feels so incredible. To know that you are entering the guitar's history is pretty pretty darn fantastic. And then also, I will say this: 
the final pro of buying a vintage guitar is that there's kind of a, a guitar geek obligation to help other people discover the joy. In so many scenarios, I've been surrounded with, with people that have incredible, incredible vintage guitars. We're talking like pre-war herringbone D28s. We're talking some really incredible, incredible instruments. And you know what always happens? They say, here, you gotta play this. This is so cool. And that, to me, is the culmination of the awesomeness that happens with vintage guitars. It, it's, it's not about how much they're worth. I know a lot of, a lot of us can get hung up on that, and I, I think it's valid, but it's not about how much they're worth. It's not about you know how incredibly rare they are. And again, I already mentioned it as, as kind of a, a, a perk is that it's one of a finite amount. But the fact that vintage instruments bring guitar geeks together is probably the biggest pro, the biggest, the biggest positive I can think of because it's a magical moment when you get to play a guitar that is one of a few, that is rare, that is valuable, but more so to know that the fellow guitar geek that is allowing you to play their instrument gets joy out of seeing you have that experience. So there you have it, just a kind of a, a quick list of, of pros for both sides of the coin, buying new and buying vintage, which leads me to a question I have for you, and that is this. Are you a vintage lover or are you a new guitar lover? In the comments below, let me know what you would rather play, a vintage guitar or a new guitar. No judgment either way. As I mentioned, there's, there's positives on both sides of the coin, both sides of the coin. Uh, so in the comments, let me know if you prefer vintage or you prefer new. And more importantly, let me know why. And if you happen to own a new guitar or own a vintage guitar, you can throw that model in there as well. I think it'd be cool to see in the comments this, this list of uh, people favoring vintage, people favoring new, but more importantly, seeing what guitars you guitar geeks play. The car's got a lot of pickup. It's got a cop motor, a 440 cubic inch plant. It's got cop tires, cop suspension, cop shocks. It was a model made before catalytic converters, so it'll run good on regular gas. What do you say, is it the new blues mobile or what? Since I'm at home, I figured it'd be the perfect time to jump into the Ask Me Anything questions. Back on Acoustic Tuesday's third year anniversary, you had the chance to ask me anything you wanted via video form at asktonyp.com. And during that show, I, well, I ate a bunch of hot sauce and tried to answer those questions, but there were only about 15 or 16 questions that got answered. There were so many more submitted. So I figured right now, since I'm sitting here comfortably, I'd go ahead and answer those questions that you asked. I'm not sure how many we'll get to, but we'll go ahead and dig in right now. Good morning, question. If you were stranded on a desert island, six casers are floating by, three guitars and three of adult beverage, which would you rescue first? And what would you want in all six cases? This is an awesome question from Charles, kind of a twist on the standard <laughs> desert island situation. So let me answer first what is gonna be in those six cases, three guitars, three adult beverages. Uh, first for the guitars, uh, not my 1935 Martin Singolo 17, which you saw today, uh, my custom Bourgeois OMSC, and then lastly, my, um, my custom Model L from Tom Sands. You're thinking, Tone, you don't even have that guitar yet. I don't, but I'm not planning on being stuck on a desert island for, for quite some time. As for adult beverages, oh man, that's, that's difficult because we got a lot. They would all be bourbons. Uh, so I would say probably Basil Hayden's, I would say Willet, and I would say Colonel Taylor. Those would be my three choices for the, the adult beverage cases. Now, as for which one I would rescue first, ugh. Having not played it yet, I'm gonna say my custom Model L from Tom Sands. I want a guitar that could do everything. And of those three, I think that one qualifies the most. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm betting pretty heavily on that guitar. Uh, so yeah, I'd rescue the Tom Sands custom Model L. Thanks for the question, Charles. I really dig it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at another one since these are pretty, uh, pretty inventive. Tony, this is traveling on a dream and the question i have for you has to do with guitars i have trouble memorizing the music so that i can play without having sheet music available what are some of the tips that you could uh, share that 
and how long does it take you to memorize a song so that you can play it without uh, the music? Thanks much. This is an awesome question and one that I actually get pretty frequently. So I'm really glad that you put this in video form. So in terms of memorizing a song, you know what I found? The biggest help I can offer is uh, well, first and foremost, repetition. I think to have your expectations in line prior to uh, playing the song and realizing that, you know what, it, it's gonna take me some time to repeat this, to really drive it home and, and get it memorized. But beyond that, that's kind of my stock answer. Beyond that, here's something that I've found. If I'm trying to learn something off of uh, tablature or, or written music, it takes me nearly two to three times as long as if I learn it by ear. And because the, the and, and I'm not, this isn't a knock on, on learning music. I think we all learn music in very different ways. Some people learn by ear, some people like proper sheet music, some people like tablature, some people like seeing it. So I'm taking into account all the different ways of learning here. But for me, what seems to happen is when I learn something by ear without having a visual aid to lean on, I'm actually internalizing it that much faster. Uh, hence, I can repeat it that much quicker and ultimately memorize it that much quicker. And this goes back to when I was jamming in, in my basement with, with my dad and my uncle. You know, they were showing me all these songs that they used to play back in the band days. They weren't writing them down. I just had to listen and repeat. And because of that process, you internalize it. You actually hear what it's supposed to sound like. You put your fingers where they're supposed to go. And it sounds like what it's supposed to sound like. It's this wonderful feedback loop that has me personally memorizing things so much quicker. So I would say this, uh, the big thing is to try and learn something by ear because the way that you internalize it, it's kind of, it kind of puts you on the fast track to memorization. Beyond that, there's a game I like to play. If, it, if I am learning off of written music, which I do, I don't, I don't discriminate between any type of learning. I try and, I try and kind of access all types of learning in my personal guitar journey. But when I'm learning something off of tab, I try and break it into chunks and I play this game called peekaboo. Uh, so what I do is I'll play a measure or two back to back looking at the tablature. I'll do it maybe 10 times. And then I'll slide a piece of paper over the section I was working on and I'll try to play it from memory. I'll force myself to play it from memory. And nine times out of 10, I don't get it right on the first try. But it switches my brain from visual processing to auditory processing. And to me, in terms of memorizing music, that's when the magic really happens. Uh, what an awesome question. Let's, uh, let's just go ahead and do one more today. Hey, Tony, Matt Arnold from Iowa City. Uh, two questions for you, actually. Love what you're doing, building the community here. First, in their prime, what goaltender would you rather have? Hashik, Belfour, or Crawford? Second, what was your breakthrough on using your ear when it comes to acoustic guitar? Thanks so much and congratulations on three years. What a stellar question. Uh, we've got hockey and music wrapped up into a single question. I couldn't be more excited to answer this. And apparently Coda, my dog is excited because he's barking his head off too. But uh, let's start with the goaltending question. Who would I rather have in their prime? Uh, Hasek, Belfour, or Crawford? Uh, all Chicago Blackhawks at one time or another. Um, man, I, you know, I have to say Ed Belfort. I just, I, I have to say Ed Belfort. He's, he's my favorite goalie of all time. And um, if I was coaching the team and I wanted somebody in goal that was, I knew was going to be competitive and fight, uh, it'd be Ed Belfort for sure. Uh, on to the biggest breakthrough I had with using my ear when it comes to acoustic guitar. I think for me, this is a fantastic question, something I haven't thought about, so uh, pardon my, my uh, kind of babbling here. I'm trying to get into the question and think at the same time. Um, I think for me, the biggest breakthrough was learning to find the key to a song. Um, not so much the, the act of finding the key, but more realizing that once I found the key, it unlocked all the pieces of the song that I, that I needed to know. Uh, once I found the key, I was able to match uh, a scale to the song to play the melody or to play a solo. Once I found the key, I was able to unlock the chords that I would likely encounter in a song. 
So for me, I remember, and it happened much later with the acoustic guitar. I kind of noodled on the electric, and I remember learning that notion, find the key and be able to solo with uh, the electric guitar and playing uh, the Allman Brothers album, Eat a Peach. That was literally an entire summer. I think I was 19, and I listened to that album all summer because most of the songs were in A, and I could totally jam out on the A pentatonic scale. It would sound so cool, uh, and I thought I was just like, this was amazing, it was, a, it was a revelation. But in terms of the acoustic guitar, I think when it really all started to zoom into focus is when I started playing with the bluegrass band here in Bozeman. I first moved here in 2008 and I played with that band uh, shortly thereafter. I, mean, I think I joined them in 2009 and we would play you know, three hours every Monday night. It was a standing weekly gig. And I remember not knowing 80% of the songs we were playing. But just realizing, honing in on that skill of being able to find the key and during the song start to be able to actually suss out what was happening, that was again a, a huge revelation with the acoustic guitar, specifically uh, leaning on my ear and, and being able to kind of trust my ear. So it was one of those magical moments where you start to get things, you know, quote unquote right and it feels like you're on the right path and that just further reinforces your confidence and your ability to do that kind of on the fly. What an awesome question. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, that's a wrap for the Ask Me Anything segment. Just for today, don't worry. This is actually a tradition that I'd love to keep going. So if you have a question for me, and again, it could be anything, make sure to visit asktonyp.com. Submit your question via video, just like those fine, brave souls did, and I'll go ahead and answer it on an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Now, in the meantime, what I wanna do is head back down to my studio because a couple of episodes ago, Heartbreaker Guitars did a news segment, and they talked about a guitar that was truly stunning, a guitar from Furt Guitars. And we asked Brendan if he could do a little bit more on that instrument, and well, he did, and here it is. Thanks, Tony. Acoustic Tuesday fans, welcome to the Heartbreaker of the Month. And this month, I have got an amazing Furt guitar to show you guys. Okay, Tony, this is the Furt Guitars Red Deluxe. Now you may remember, not only did we touch on this guitar in the newscast, but we talked about this instrument when it was just in the developing stages last year. And it's finally come to fruition. The guitar has arrived at Heartbreaker Guitars. There's two versions. There's this one, which is spruce over Indian rosewood. And then we've got the second one coming in about three weeks, which is Alpine Coco Bolo. But first off, let's take a look at this one. This is the SRGC Red Deluxe. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at the specs. We've got a master grade spruce top. We've got this really cool wooden sound hole Coa rosette with abalone binding. This is Zero Cody fretboard and bridge. And the show stealer, the body bevel. Now this guitar actually has two bevels. It's got the body bevel here for the rib cage and then it's also got the armrest right here. We've got the abalone purfling here. Flamed Coa binding throughout. And this thing is just a stunner. We've got a 25 and a half inch scale length, Tony, and that's a one and three quarter inch nut.
Guys, thanks so much for watching. This was the heartbreaker of the month. This is the FERC Red Deluxe SR. And don't forget, the, ex the same exact guitar is also going to be available in Alpine over Coco Bolo. Pricing on these guitars for this one, it's around 3,600. The Coco Bolo run is right about 4,600. But for dual bevels, master grade woods, handcrafted in the Czech Republic, this thing is pure value. Thanks for watching again, guys. Tony, appreciate all you do. Acoustic Tuesday fans, thanks again for watching, and we will see you guys next month. That's Toby the Beagle. I'm Brendan, signing off from Las Vegas, Nevada. See you guys. So there you have it, a stellar guitar from Furt Guitars, and it just goes to show that new guitars can be just as awesome as vintage guitars, and of course, vintage guitars can be just as awesome as new guitars. And remember that question I asked you very early on in today's little hang session? What's your preference, vintage or new? Make sure to let me know in the comments below if you haven't already. I wanna thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Remember, you can catch the Acoustic Tuesday show every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Now, since we're gearing up for the new season of Acoustic Tuesday starting in October, remember, you can still join me every Tuesday. I'm gonna be hanging at home and, of course, well, waiting for a baby to arrive. But, uh, of course, there's plenty of guitar geek happenings that I wanna share with you. So, again, please tune in every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time and look forward to that new season of Acoustic Tuesday starting in October. My favorite favorite month. I mean, Halloween. We already started watching horror movies last night. And I got to tell you, we watched this movie House, released in 1986. It was, it was atrocious. It was really bad. Whitney's quote, I think I'm now dumber for having watched that movie. I, on the other hand, absolutely loved it. But that's not the point. The whole point is there's a new season of Acoustic Tuesday coming in October, and I do hope you will join me. I keep forgetting to take a sneak peek into next week, and we should just go ahead and take care of that right now. Next week, you're gonna get the scoop behind this guitar here, the Martin Custom OM Tuxedo. How it came to be, and the lesson that it taught me. Not to mention that, I've been getting tons of questions about my home studio. What's in it, what type of gear, and I'm gonna go ahead and give you a studio tour next week. So look forward to that, and I'll see you then. Again, thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek, and remember, guitar geeks unite. Cheers. Bye.